Hi, I'm Chris Martin. Here we are again in the Martin Museum, and behind me is the ukulele display. And if I start laughing spontaneously, I'm sorry, I can't help it. Every time I think about a uke, every time I think about what they do and how they make people feel, it makes me smile. And I'll bet it will too if you pick one up. They're a lot of fun. Who would think they'd be back? They're back and they're wildly popular. Uh, we got into the uke business, believe it or not, in 1907. 1907, my great-grandfather built some prototype ukuleles. The ukulele itself, or ukulele, is actually, its roots are traced back to Portugal. And it's a, it's a Hawaiian adaptation of an instrument that merchant sailors, Portuguese merchant sailors, who were in the South Pacific whaling, when they called on the seaports in Hawaii, they bartered or sold their instruments to the Hawaiians. The Hawaiians modified them, incorporated them into their indigenous musical culture, and the rest is history. So by the turn of the last century, Americans were becoming familiar with and enamored with all things Hawaiian. Very exotic place, and still you could get there. You could take a steamship, or somebody knew somebody that went there, or they saw pictures in a magazine. And so in 1907, uh, Frank, my great-grandfather, built some prototypes just like a guitar because, hey, it's just a little guitar. And he sent them out to the dealers, and they sent them back. They said, no working. And he said, huh, I thought it was just like a little guitar. Well, it turns out they're much more delicate. They have to be built very delicately. They're small, they have a short scale length, thin strings. And so he took a closer look at what was coming out of Hawaii, which, you know, they were, they were what they were. And he recognized that he could make a better mousetrap, but that he had to stay true to what was coming out of the box, the sound. The original ones he made had spruce tops. He realized that wasn't appropriate. And they were wildly overbraced. And once he got over that and, you know, refined it, and it took him several years because it, I, you know, we were making guitars. The uke was sort of a, oh, well, you know, maybe we'll get around to it, sideline kind of thing. We were reluctant to get back into the business because there was a period of time when we stopped. Um, in fact, there's been several periods of time in the history of the company when we stopped making ukuleles. And every time when we go to start up again, we've got to retool, which is a, it's a, quite, a, quite an undertaking, as you can imagine. So, about 1915, it was 1915, there was an exhibition in San Francisco. It's kind of a World's Fair called the Pan Pacific Exposition. And one of the displays, one of the features was Hawaii. And that, that opened the floodgates. Now, people didn't have to go to Hawaii. All they had to do was go to this World's Fair. And anybody who's been to a World's Fair know they, they attract a lot of people. And people just went crazy. They went crazy for everything about Hawaii, including the music and including wanting to play that music on, of course, ukuleles, and also playing slack key slide guitars. We have a couple of those on display here in the museum um, around the corner. So we started to make ukuleles, and they sold, and they sold, and they sold, and they sold. And through the teens, right up through the mid-1920s, we were making more ukuleles than we were guitars. In fact, there was a year that we made 14,000 ukuleles in the mid-1920s. It was a fad. The country hit some economic headwinds with the Depression and the run-up to World War II. And that boom, which when you think about it, 1907 to, to, uh, to 1925 was pretty long-lasting. Um, it began a, a fairly rapid decline. And uh, the ukulele sales dropped dramatically. When the war was over, and the soldiers came home, demand picked up, it picked up for guitars, and the ukulele was kind of left in the dust. Until the 1950s, when Arthur Godfrey played a ukulele on his TV show, and that created a resurgence of interest in the ukulele, and we got back into the business again. And now, you all remember Tiny Tim, right? We were fortunate um, recently to be able to acquire for the museum collection Tiny Tim's ukulele. Unfortunately, Tiny Tim himself did not do a lot for the demand for ukuleles. Although, if, if you look at the people that have played ukuleles successfully, 
he was in that mold. How did we get back into it? Um, we definitely got out of it. We got out of the business. There was virtually no demand, although there was, there was continuing interest from our Japanese distributor. They would tell us that the, the, the Uke has a, a, an underground popularity in Japan that never really went away. But it wasn't enough for us to get back into the business. We'd say, well, how many do you want? And they'd say, well, a couple. And we'd say, well, you know, it's just not worth retooling for a couple. And, but they, they didn't give up. They were very persistent. And uh, so we said, OK, you know, maybe this is worth doing. They are our best customer for, for export business. And uh, you know, if we're going to do it, and we're going to justify the tooling costs, let's start at the top. So we made a prototype of a 5K. And we committed ourselves to, if they agree to buy some of these, we can begin the process of amortizing the cost of all the tooling and fixturing that we will have to, have to create to make these 5K, and then work our way down to the threes and, and, the, and the, the standard models. So Rick and I, Rick Ferrero, who's our, our, our international sales rep for that part of the world, go to Tokyo. And we've got the prototype with us. And we meet with uh, Mr. Kurosawa and Tomo and, and all the executives. And we're sitting around the table. And they keep looking at the little case. And they know what's up. We said, they said, that's a, that's a uke, isn't it? We said, yeah. We brought a prototype with you. We want to talk to you about your continued interest and, and the, the fact that you're, you're very dogged in wanting us to get back into this business. And we're willing to consider it. And we'd like you to take a look at this prototype and think, tell us if this is appropriate. You know, ha have we been able to recreate something that we really haven't made for 10 or 20 years. And we pulled it out of the case, and of course, they, they were all very excited. You know, they, they love high-end guitars in Japan. They're really, the, they're wonderful customers. And so we had, you know, Curly Koa and the Pearl Inlay and the, and the gloss finish, and they passed it around. A couple of them played. Of course, they smiled, you know, as anybody does when they pick up a ukulele. And then they started to talk to themselves in Japanese. And so Rick and I are, hmm, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know. And they said, well, what's the price? And we said, well, you know, these aren't cheap. Now, bear in mind that used 5Ks, they're five to $7,000. Um, and we said, you know, we're, we're really going to have to set the suggested retail price on this at about $5,000. Um, one of the reasons is you may think ukuleles are easier to make because they're small. They're actually more difficult to make because they're small. So again, more discussion in Japanese. And Rick and I are like, hmm, we don't know if this is going well or not. And then Tomo says to Rick, he says, uh, we've talked. We'll take 50. And Rick and I looked at each other, and, and I said, Rick, did, did I hear them correctly? And he said, I think he said 50. And that got us back in the uke business. So today, in my travels, I have discovered that not only is the uke wildly popular in Japan, it's also wildly popular in New Zealand and Australia and England, parts of Europe, Canada, and the United States. And now you Google or go on YouTube, go on YouTube and put in ukulele. Wild stuff, crazy. I mean, there's a woman who plays on the streets of Honolulu, plays rock and roll on an amplified ukulele. Fun stuff. Um, so I'm glad we're back in this business. Now we're, we've moved up in size. We've got concert, a little bigger. There's one, a um, little bigger than the soprano. And still a little bigger is the tenor. So now, you know, if you're really crazy about ukes, you can get one of each, you can get three. Someday we'll probably have to reintroduce the baritone. But uh, for the time being, we're pretty darn busy. Uh, we've gone from making none of these to thousands of them. And it's, it's heartwarming to me. My grandfather and great-grandfather would get a big kick out of the fact that the ukulele is back. I'm going to turn it over to Tim, my colleague, who has been very intimate in the development of the new Martin ukuleles. And he's going to talk to you about some of the specific features that make these the best Martin ukuleles we've ever made. Hello, my name is Tim Teal, and I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about our new two-style ukuleles. Uh, the two-style refers to an appointment level. Uh, for instance, uh, the two-style receives ivroid binding on the top and the back. Um, it also has a very specific position marker on the fingerboard, and we also want to make sure we put side dots on the fingerboard so everybody knows exactly what fret they're, they're playing on. 
um, a couple of the improvements we made to these new Martin ukuleles over some of the ones in the past uh, are a compensated scale length, which incorporates a new style saddle, uh, which is compensated. This saddle also drops into the bridge instead of being glued in. This allows a customer to put in an uh, under saddle pickup of their choosing, or you could have us install one for you. The, the smallest one, which is um, the Soprano, and that's what I'm holding, has a 13 inch scale length. So this is our, our tenor size ukulele, which is uh, in this case a 2K tenor. Uh, again, the, the, the K refers to the wood choice. The two refers to the style. Since it is a bigger size and during our consultation with real ukulele players, the one thing we discovered that we wanted to change is, is the bridge design. Uh, the Martin ukuleles from years past had pin bridges. Uh, we decided to lose the pin bridge and replace it with a tie style bridge, which actually makes it much easier to string up. All of the two style ukuleles that we looked at come in a uh, genuine mahogany choice as well, which would be known just as a uh, two uke or a two concert uke or a two tenor uke. And this one shows uh, that wood choice on the, the back sides and the top. So it's a uh, genuine mahogany. Uh, just a, a beautiful ukulele. One of the advancements we made with the new ukulele line is to uh, make an applied dovetail. Now, I know there's been a lot of questions about what that is, and I'd like to answer those for you today. Uh, this is basically what the applied dovetail looks like once it's been applied to the neck. This particular neck has a fingerboard on it. So the neck, as it comes off of the CNC machine, has a nice radius put in the bottom of the neck. This radius fits exactly to the radius of the front block area on the ukulele. What's nice about that is there's no need to physically undercut this area, which keeps it very nice. So while we're doing that, we also put some location holes in this area. And then we cut a little tiny dovetail. And there, as you can see, there's some little pins here. Those little pins fit right in the holes that are on the neck, so it lines up that dovetail. Uh, before we apply the dovetail, we put a nice bead of glue onto the dovetail so we get a nice secure joint. And then we also take a, a, a little screw and screw that dovetail tight to the neck. That acts as a clamp for the glue and it also, over its life, helps hold the applied dovetail onto the neck. It works the same as it would if it were cut out from one solid chunk, which gives the same tonal response that you would get from a, a traditional style dovetail, but it's much more efficient for us. So we can keep the price down for the end consumer. So you have to come and visit. You have to come and, and check out the museum, take the factory tour. We're open weekdays, work days. Museum's open when we unlock the doors in the morning. We give factory tours all day long. Go on the website, check it out. Um, See Tiny Tim's uke, you can also see, very cool, behind me in the display case, in a beautiful blue, light blue velour lined with a zipper case on display is a ukulele that my grandfather commissioned for his bride, my grandmother Daisy. And the very cool thing about it, now it's a five, so it's, you know, it's over the top in terms of, of inlay, it's made from curly Cuban mahogany. Man, we can't, as Americans, we're not even allowed to go to Cuba today. But back then, we were sourcing mahogany out of Cuba, and my grandfather came across a board with curl and commissioned a spectacularly beautiful ukulele for my grandmother, Daisy. Come and check it out.